What's up guys, it's Friday, and so we've been doing this for years. You know what time it is, it's time for What The Fitness. And this week we have on a return guest, Glucose Goddess. Can't remember her exact name, I apologize. I just know that's the moniker she goes by. She's on Lewis Howes podcast, and I apologize if I butcher his last name. I don't know if it's Howes, Hose, I think Howes. So somebody feel free to correct me because I don't wanna keep saying the wrong thing. The title is How to Eat Sugar Without the Consequences. So let's see how we can eat sugar without consequences. The best time to eat that sugar so that you have maximum dopamine from it, maximum pleasure and less impact on your body is gonna be after a meal as dessert. Uh, I don't know what dopamine studies she's citing for that. I would love to see them. I'm not aware of dopamine studies on food order, but I, I suppose it's possible. But don't ever, doesn't everybody argue that you don't want the dopamine response? That's part of like the, the drug addiction response. Isn't that what they argue? These people end up talking out of both sides of their mouth. But yeah, so she says the word always. So just, just for perspective, real experts very, very, very rarely use words like always, never, best, worst, because that's not really how that works. Your body is much more complicated than just individual pathways. And say things like best, worst, always, never, just really removes a lot of nuance from things. But I digress. Always avoid eating sugar in the morning. Okay, so really? yes, oh. so breakfast should God be forbid. savory. Okay, in the morning, nothing sweet. Really? Except, yeah. Oh, man, those Here we go with this. One study back in like 2007 that called it metabolic flexibility, which basically said, oh, if you eat carbs in the morning, it reduces your metabolic flexibility. Never showed up as any real outcome data. And guess what? If you want to be metabolically flexible, eat a combination of a well-balanced diet of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. That's how to be metabolically flexible. I, I know what she's gonna say, which is, oh, well, if you just have carbs by themselves, it's gonna spike your blood glucose. And pastries, donuts, cookies, most of them have just as much, if not more calories from fat than they do sugar. The glucose spike is likely going to be attenuated by the fact that many of these foods have quite a bit of fat in them. But I digress. Pastries though, with ah. the chocolate inside and just, oh I man, know. the donut in the morning. Keep them for dessert after lunch. Because if you have them in the morning, then what's happening in your body? As you digest that sugar and those carbs, they turn into glucose molecules. And these arrive into your bloodstream really quickly and cause what's called a glucose spike. So oh. blood sugar spike. And then about 90 minutes later, Lewis, your glucose levels are gonna drop you're gonna feel a crash. Yeah, yeah, um, so they spike and drop if you eat like glucose by itself. But honestly, even if you have like a oral glucose tolerance test, which is 75 grams of pure dextrose, if you have normal insulin sensitivity, you clear that like a normal human and you don't have this big crash. It goes up, it spikes, it starts to come back down, then it kind of levels out in the back end. You're not having a big crash. If you have reactive hypoglycemia, then you have to worry about blood sugar crashes. And also, okay, don't do it after breakfast. All right, so what if we do it after lunch? Isn't it gonna be the same? I guess maybe after an overnight fast, she's saying you don't have food in your system, so it's gonna spike the glucose up even higher. Talk about making mountains out of mohills. That is what this shit is doing. Like there's no consideration for an overall diet quality no, we're just focusing on like, oh my God, blood sugar went up. Now it's 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and all of a sudden you feel more cravings for sweet foods. You're like, I need a cookie, I need some chocolate, I need a snack. I need that spike again. And then you spike again, and then all day you're on a roller coaster where you feel addicted to sugar. Ah, here we go, addicted to sugar. So I know this is gonna hurt a lot of feelings out there, but uh, sugar by itself in isolation is not addictive in humans. There's quite a bit of data on this, you can read. And this is the whole, well, if you spike glucose, it's gonna come back down. And as it's coming back down, it's gonna make you crave more of it. Yeah, this was a popular theory 20 years ago that never panned out. It never showed that it was addictive. You know why people like cookies and sweets? Lean in closer. 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 It's because they taste good. Oh my God, wow! It's the same reason people like doing anything that feels good. Just because something feels good doesn't make it addictive, all right? Can we please go ahead? Hugs feel good, doesn't make it addictive. Can you have people who become addicted to certain things 
for sure. But we don't tell everyone that sex spikes out dopamine. Nobody have sex. Everybody's going celibate. Oh well, with AI, we're probably heading there anyway. This is such a black and white, yes, no, robotic, quite frankly, intellectually lazy way to think about things. She didn't get to this in the video, but she says, you know, if you eat your other foods first, it blunts the glucose spike. That's true. So, and she's citing one particular study that I'll, I'll put here, where they look at an acute response of blood sugar to a meal over three hours with people eating protein and vegetables before starches versus people eating the starches first. And what they found was if you ate the starches first, blood sugar goes up higher, faster, but they only looked out to three hours. And if you look at the graphs, if you look at the overall area under the curve, at three hours, starches first group, blood sugars pretty much come back to baseline. The other group, blood sugar still hasn't really come back to baseline. So I asked the question, what would happen if they measured longer? And is the overall area under the curve of your body's blood sugar response any different? Is it actually different? The amount of glucose that appears in your bloodstream is it different overall? And I always thought the answer was, I don't know, no. Because if it has the same bioavailability, it is going to get into circulation, unless you're gonna argue that the liver is preferentially taking out more carbohydrates with a slower release rate, which I suppose might be possible. But does it actually matter in long-term outcomes? And so this same lab that conducted that short-term test did a what, what? What? Human randomized control trial examining the effects of meal order over the course of several months looking at different markers of blood sugar regulation. And what did they find? No significant differences in any marker of insulin sensitivity or glucose. Now, that being said, there may be benefits to choosing to do your food order where you do protein and veggies first. But it is probably much more practical in that if you are satiated from protein and vegetables, you're less likely to eat more starches and more dessert if you feel full. This is something in science that we call Occam's razor, which plainly stated means if all other things are equal, the simplest answer is usually correct. The actual literal interpretation is, if all things are equal, the hypothesis that requires the least amount of assumptions is probably true. When you are basically saying, well, you wanna eat in this order because if you do this, blood sugar is gonna come up, it's gonna come back down, cause you to crave more, go up, come back down. You're having to make a lot of assumptions to come to that conclusion. And when we actually look at the direct data, the direct data does not support the claim. But again, that doesn't mean food order doesn't matter because again, if eating protein and vegetables first helps you feel more satiated and means you eat less starches and desserts, then it still may be a useful tool. It's just not working for the reason that she says it's working. But people don't like that Occam's razor explanation because then it boils down to what? 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 Oh, that's right. Calories in, calories out, which many people hate because it requires some acknowledgement of personal responsibility. But if it's just big evil food in government making you addicted to sugar that's spiking your glucose and spiking your dopamine and causing you to be addicted to sugar, then, oh, it's not your fault. But also, if you're an addict, you don't have a lot of power. But if you take personal responsibility, you have power. Again, people take it and go way too far. The lane is fat shaming, blah, blah. No, no, no. I think there are multiple reasons people become obese and it's not just laziness. I don't even think laziness is the biggest reason why people become obese by far. I think there's a lot of things that go into it. It may not be your fault that you became obese. There could be a lot of things that played into it. Trauma, stress, medical problems. But until you take and internalize that it does require some personal responsibility to make change, you are gonna stay stuck. So you can either select the ego satisfaction of believing that you have no power and that it's not your fault, or you can take the empowering position of, I'm a human, I make mistakes, I haven't done things perfectly, it's not all my fault, but I have the power to make different choices. And that, my friends, 
That one is on you.